Hello. Last week I explained how we could take an audio signal that you've recorded on your computer and panel beat it into a form that could be read into a JavaScript program. Today I'll be talking about a mathematical operation that we can apply to that audio signal called the Fourier transform. Or rather, I'll be showing you the basic Fourier transform, and then explaining why we can't apply it to a recorded signal as it stands. I shall also talk about a slightly more practical version called the discrete Fourier transform. Finally, we have a much faster version of the DFT called the fast Fourier transform, which is used pretty much universally. As such, I shall dedicate an entire video to the FFT and merely mention its existence in this one. Needless to say, this video will be very heavy on the maths. If you don't like calculus and powers of E, this might be a good moment to bail on the video. I'll quite understand. Similarly, if you're expecting to hear all about the fast Fourier transform, you're just going to have to learn to live with your disappointment for a couple of weeks. Take a look at these four graphs. The two on the left are the standard sort of XY graphs that you're used to. They both show a regular repeating signal as it varies with increasing X. Concentrate on the graph in the top left corner. What you see is a sine wave, something that you've probably seen when you studied A-level mathematics or looked at an audible tone displayed on an oscilloscope screen. That sine wave has a certain frequency and a certain amplitude, which is how high the sine wave is from peak to trough. If that sine wave were indeed on an oscilloscope screen, you could think of the amplitude as the strength of the signal. The graph in the top right shows that same sine wave, but this time on a frequency graph. Instead of the horizontal axis being x, it is f for frequency. And the sine wave is represented by a single spike. Well, less of a spike, more of a vertical line, indicating that all the wave is concentrated at that single value, with no part of it being at any other value, no matter how close. The height of this vertical line indicates the amplitude of that single frequency, which is why I've labelled the vertical axis on that graph as strength, rather than simply y. The graph at the bottom left shows a compound signal made of two sine waves added together, with different frequencies and amplitudes. This corresponds to the frequency graph at the bottom right. You can see the two frequencies present in the compound signal as two vertical lines, two different frequencies with two different amplitudes. In the world of mathematics, the horizontal lines on those left-hand graphs would probably be labelled as x. In the world of audio signals, x will be replaced with t for time, to indicate the signals changing with time. Both the graphs on the right would have horizontal axes labelled frequency, but in the world of mathematics, you'd think of frequency in terms of radians or even degrees. In the world of audio signal processing, radians would be replaced with hertz. In 1822, the French mathematician Jean-Baptiste Fourier showed that some functions could be derived by adding together an infinite number of harmonic frequencies. Although he didn't fully investigate the field of spectral analysis, the Fourier transform was named after him. And here's the equation for it, written in full hieroglyphics, of course. Here, fx represents the initial function. Because I'm keeping things nice and general, the function is given in terms of x rather than t for time. By tradition, the Fourier transform that function is written by putting a circumflex, that's that little hat, on the letter representing the function, so f becomes f circumflex. Whereas function f is given in terms of x, you calculate the Fourier transform for a particular frequency, which is that squiggly thing. That's the Greek letter xi, and it's the variable that marks the horizontal axis on the frequency chart. The idea is that for any given function f, you try a large number of values of psi from the zero upwards to give a frequency spectrum. This would either be a series of spikes, or vertical lines if you like, or some sort of smooth curve. As you can see, the maths isn't particularly easy. e to the power of pi times i times something, where i is the square root of minus 1, multiplied by the function, and then the integral taken from minus infinity to plus infinity. Well, I did warn you. In practice, it will be a difficult task for all but the simplest functions. Let's try an example. We'll take the simplest repeating function, which is a sine wave given by the equation fx 
equals sine x. Stick that in the equation and you get what you see above. If you crash through the maths, and I don't recommend it, for various values of psi, then you'll find that all the values you calculate will come out at zero, except for when psi is 2 pi, what we used to call 360 degrees in old money. Then the value calculated will be equal to the amplitude of the sine wave. That's because 2 pi is the frequency of the sine wave, and that's the only frequency present in f of x. I should, in fairness, point out that there is also a Fourier inverse transform, which is a similar function that lets you reconstruct the original function of x from all the calculated psi values. I've never tried this mathematically. Still, I'm sure that this Fourier inverse transform does work. I include it only for completeness. By now, you've undoubtedly spotted the difficulty with applying the Fourier transform to any but the simplest of audio signals. Not only does it require a shed load of mathematics, but it also requires a mathematical equation. Imagine trying to get a mathematical equation for that. Nope, can't be done. What we need is a more practical form of the Fourier transform. Fortunately, there is one, specifically designed for rapid application to normal audio data, like the sort of signal that you see before you. I'm talking about the fast Fourier transform, or FFT, and it is so useful that it has an entirely eclipsed the straightforward Fourier transform, and is used just about universally. However, before I talk about the fast Fourier transform, I have to introduce you to the concept of a discrete Fourier transform. Here you see an audio signal divided up into time slots of a given fixed length. Typically this might be 50 milliseconds, or 100 milliseconds, or even 200 milliseconds. The signal has been digitized at a certain sampling rate, so each of those time slots corresponds to a fixed number of signal samples. For example, if the sampling rate were 10 kilohertz, that means there are 10,000 samples taken every second. Looked at another way, each sample taken corresponds to one ten thousandth of a second, or 0.1 milliseconds. If your slot length were 50 milliseconds, that would take up 500 samples. A slot length of 20 milliseconds would account for 200 samples. We now apply the following equation to each of those time slots. Effectively, what we're doing is calculating a local Fourier transform that applies only to that small segment of time. The equation bears quite a lot of resemblance to the classic Fourier equation, but the integral of the continuous function becomes a discrete summation over a range of values. Also, the letters used have changed as well. Here, capital N is the number of samples and we count through them using small n as a counter. Note that it goes from 0 up to capital N minus 1. k in this equation represents which sample of the Fourier transform we are calculating. k steps along the frequency axis and is the discrete equivalent of psi in the standard Fourier equations that I showed you before. I'm not exactly sure how k relates to a frequency in hertz, but just take it that we can calculate the equation for k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, etc up to n as well. All the counting starts from zero. Lowercase f, n, represents the value of the sample signal for sample n, and capital F, k, is the calculated DFT value. Capital F, k, is basically the strength of the frequency k present in that particular sample. If n is 100, for example, then we start off with 100 sampled images, labeled from lowercase f, zero, to lowercase f 99, and we end up with 100 calculated Fourier values from capital F 0 to capital F 99. The capital sigma, that thing looks like a large bent capital E, represents summation, and it means that we add together all the fn values weighted by e to the power of whatever, starting with little n as 0 and going all the way up to little n being 1 less than capital N. If you have the requisite experience in maths to cope with all this taradiddle, then the letters e, pi, and i will be old friends for you. Strangely, the first term, where you divide by capital N, is sometimes missed out. Some authoritative versions of DFT include it, some equally authoritative versions miss it out. I'll be interested to read in the comments what the official stance on this is, to divide by N or not to divide by N. Now, it won't have escaped your attention that the equation contains i, the square root of minus 1. 
If you try finding the square root of minus 1 on the calculator, it falls over and catches fire. So how are we supposed to calculate a value for fk? Well, that i is included so that we can specify the different phases of the component frequencies. Take a look at these two graphs. They both consist of the same two sine waves added together, but the phase of the smaller signal is different. You end up with two very different compound signals. What we do is calculate the mass, keeping the letter i in the equations right up to the last moment, and then use it to calculate the strength and phase of each component in turn. An example will make all this clear. Imagine that we have a signal composed of three sinusoid frequencies, f0, f1 and f2. When you crank the handle on the DFT, each of these frequencies drops out, complete with a real component along the horizontal axis and an imaginary component up the vertical axis. This pair of axes you'll probably recognise as an Argan diagram. Since this signal is one that goes up and down as time goes on, that's what signals do, we model it by having these lines going round and round the origin, like hands on some demented clock. By tradition, we think of them as rotating anti-clockwise, and since these components represent different frequencies, they all rotate at different speeds. The actual signal, the thing that we see on the oscilloscope screen, is found by adding together the real parts of the signals at any point. Take a snapshot of the demented clock face at any moment in time, and work out the horizontal component of each of those lines in whatever embarrassing positions they find themselves. Positive if they extend to the right at all, negative if they extend to the left. Here I've illustrated that with a simple animation. Ah, the benefits of being an animator, eh? Have you visited my animation channel, by the way? Link in the description for those who are interested. Anyway, enough of the trumpet blowing. Those rotating coloured bars represent three Fourier components. Capital F0, capital F1 and capital F2 for some signal. In practice, you'd have hundreds or even thousands of them. The frequency of each corresponds to the time it takes the bar to make one complete circuit. Imagine that you, the observer, are standing directly above those bars looking down at them. Each bar casts a coloured projection on the screen below, like a coloured shadow if you like, which extends and shrinks and goes positive and then negative. On the right, I've laid out those same coloured projections end to end, extending to the right or left as I do on the left-hand screen. By adding these bars together, we can reconstruct the original compound signal that produced them. Isn't that sweet? Now you can see why we need the imaginary component i in that formula. Right at the end of the process, if we decide that we don't need the phase information about each component, then we can reduce all the components to strength values only. But until we reach that stage, we keep i in. More practically, Here's a mathematical example of how we can calculate the DFT for a very small time slot. To keep things simple, the slot only has three samples in it, 2, minus 3, and 5, which become the values of small f0, small f1, and small f2. Since there are three samples, we must calculate three Fourier values, capital F0, capital F1, and capital F2, using ye olde discrete Fourier transform formula. Underneath the formula, I have written out the summation as a list of terms with plus signs between them, so that we can boot that large Greek sigma. Aren't you glad I didn't pick an example slot with a thousand values in it? The terms are identical, except I have substituted zero for small n in the first term, one for n in the second, and two for n in the third. Take a look at that first term. The power of e reduces to zero as one of the multiplied numbers is zero. e to the power of zero like anything to the power of zero, gives one, so that e to the power of bits in that first term disappears, and it simply reduces to small f zero, whatever that is. Here I have tidied up those powers and substituted in the values of small f zero to two. You'll notice that we haven't touched k yet. This is the point where we calculate the Fourier transform for the different values of k. The easiest one is capital F zero, because we just put k equals zero into that expression. All the powers become zero, so the powers of E simply disappear. F0 is therefore found by adding together the sample values themselves, taking account of the negative signs, of course. In this case, F0 comes out as 4. At the bottom, you see F0 displayed on an Argan diagram, 
extending four units along the horizontal axis, the one for real numbers. It has no imaginary component, so the phase angle is zero. It's essentially an ordinary number, with magnitude four. In fact, capital F zero will always be an ordinary number, however many samples you have. This is because it is calculated from the formula with both small n and k equal to zero, resulting in all those powers of E disappearing. You saw from that animation that the different Fourier components rotate round the zero point as time goes on. It's the relationship between the components that counts. So you might as well nail the first one firmly to the real number axis and work out all the others in relationship to it. Here's the formula for F1. And this is the point where we say adios to those powers of E. To do that, we apply another mathematical shift as shown. E to the power of I multiplied by some expression is always the same as the cosine of that expression plus I times the sine of the expression. The two expressions that we are interested in are minus two thirds of pi and minus four thirds of pi. Now, I'm a feet and inches kind of guy, and I'm not that fond of radians. I mean, I'll use them when I have no choice, but I'd much rather work with old fashioned degrees. In old money, those two angles come out as minus 120 degrees and minus 240 degrees. And I've worked out the cosine and sine of those angles, as you can see. Here I've put in the cosine and sine in the formula and tied it up afterwards. Once the dust has settled, you can see that F1 comes out as 1 plus 1.732i, which I've added to the Argan diagram on the bottom right of the screen. This component has a magnitude of two units and a phase angle of 60 degrees. To calculate F2, we apply the formula we produced for Fk, putting in k equals 2. Second verse, same as the first. Here are the numbers that we get, and the sines and cosines are very similar to the values that we got before. That's basically because we're dealing with 60 degree angles above some number of turns or half turns of the rotating vectors. And here is the final result of the calculation. The real component comes out as 1, again, but the imaginary component is now minus 6.928. And here you see F2 added to the Argan diagram, along with the other two components. This lets you see the relationship between them. The magnitude of that line, its length, comes out as 7, and the phase angle is minus 81.8 degrees. Here you have a summary of the three Fourier components that we calculated. So much complexity stemming from three simple numbers. In the field of artificial intelligence, we would probably only be interested in the magnitudes, or strengths if you like, of the Fourier components, and we would not bother to calculate the phase angles. However, if you do have the phase angles, you have described that particular time slot from your audio pretty much exactly. Indeed, there is an inverse discrete Fourier transform that lets you reconstruct your set of signal samples from the magnitudes and phase angles of the different frequency components you've just calculated. I've put the formula up there at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to crash through the mathematics if you've got the stomach for it. So there you are, the Fourier transform and how it can be practically applied to some digitized audio signal. Of course, you can apply it to any time signal that you want, not just recorded sound, but we're most interested in applying it to sound with a view to automatic recognition. As it stands, the DFT does require a great many calculations. That's no problem for JavaScript programmers for whom speed is not a necessity. If your program has got as much time as it wants to produce the answer, then the DFT is perfectly adequate. However, most people who want to apply a Fourier analysis to a time signals want it done in real time, preferably in hardware, and so speed is of the essence. Something as slow and laboured as DFT simply will not do. That's why the super fast, super slick version of the DFT was invented. Step forward the fast Fourier transform, or FFT. But that, as they say, is a tale for another time. <laughs>